Oh, this is such a bad look. Hmm? Huh? Okay, we got a Woj update. Let's see. ESPN has been conducting its own investigation, has acquired text messages and emails. Okay, let's see what's going on. A few minutes later. Welcome back, guys. This is a story I did not really want to have to cover, but because it's very relevant to the Dallas Mavericks and has huge ramifications if something were to come of it, it's really a story I can't avoid and still cover the team faithfully. So here you go. It's my civic duty to you guys, pretty much. Uh, let's let's dive into the KP rape allegations. So ESPN has managed to acquire text messages and emails from KP, the woman, and the Knicks legal department. And in this, they have been able to paint a greater picture of what happened. We still don't know everything. There are still some questions that need to be answered on both sides. But this at least gives us our first real look at it beyond just the allegations itself. There's a little bit of substance here we can look at. And some things that will either answer questions or just raise further questions. So here's what we know. The accuser in question here is a 29-year-old woman who lives in KP's former apartment building. And the incident in question, what we already know, occurred February 7th, 2018. The night KP tore his ACL. Now, that might raise some questions, but it doesn't dispel the accusations on its own. So... Let's continue forward. According to the woman, she went to KP's apartment to, I guess, meet him for the first time. They had seen each other in the building, but she wanted to go get his autograph. Why you would go after he just suffered a devastating injury? I don't know, but that's what the story says. She went to get his autograph, and somewhere in the conversation, he got her phone number. Don't know if he asked for it. Don't know if she offered it up. Regardless, he got her phone number. Sometime later that night, he texted her, inviting her over, even saying that he was drunk. Those are his words in this case. So KP invites her over, and the incident itself takes place, whether that's just the two having sex, or whether or not it's what she alleges a sexual assault or rape. I don't like talking about this, so I'm going to try and set aside my own discomfort with this to give you guys the accurate picture as it's been depicted here. Now, the woman alleges that KP punched her in the face several times, damaging the cartilage of her nose to the point that she ended up having to have corrective surgery, which cost approximately $10,000 after the fact. She says that he spit in her face, that he said he owned her, and that she was his slave. Now, this is an African-American woman, so that carries extra weight of, dear God, why, and messed up. So, that's what's been alleged here. She stayed with him until 11 o'clock the following morning, and after the fact, the two continued to converse. Now, she says, after he sobered up some, that he became much gentler and kinder, and even appeared remorseful for what had happened. She alleges then that he offered her some kind of compensation to make up for what he had just done. This is how we get to the $68,000 check for her brother's college tuition. She says first he was offering something along the lines of business investments, and what she ultimately elected for was the check. So, here's my questions. We find out that KP... After the incident, she continued to pursue him for months after the incident. She continued to text him to specifically request and imply that she wanted to sleep with him again and sent salacious photos of herself in the process. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing this on the surface by itself. Grown adults, they're going to do what they want to do, and I'm certainly not by any means trying to slut shame or anything like that for her. Uh, just on its own merit. My question is, if you allege whether or not he appeared 
to be a different person after he sobered up in your eyes. If somebody physically beats you to the point of needing corrective surgery, spits in your face, and degrades you verbally, and it's, why? She says that he had his way with her without her consent. Why on earth do you continue to reach out to this man? Why do you continue to specifically push for sex? Why do you send him photos to try and entice him when he's not initially reciprocating that interest? Those are immediate questions I have. Now, there could be answers to those that somewhat validate it, but it's an immediate question. But let's continue. I'm not sure when this contract is supposedly signed, and the reason I say supposedly is because we don't even know if this contract is real. At some point after the $68,000 was figured out, it sounds like she wrote up by hand a contract which he was willing to co-sign. Now, here are my questions. It sounds like, I keep saying that, by the way, I noticed that. Throughout the document, as we were given the text, we find out that his name is misspelled every single time. She calls him Kristop, Mr. Kristop, not Mr. Porzingis, or his actual first name, Kristops. No S on the end. Based on the story, it sounds like even his supposed signature, which his, lo uh, his lawyer contends may well be a forgery, it sounds like even in his signature that there's not an S in his name and at the end of his first name. So if it's handwritten and it's drawn up by a woman who clearly didn't know how to spell his name, is there a chance that the signature is a forgery and it's just continuing not knowing how to spell his name? Sure. When Porzingis and his legal counsel requested the original document to you know validate this, because again, if she got his autograph, it wouldn't be that hard to take that signature, you would think, and apply it to the paper, which then makes the misspelling even stranger. But still, they requested the original document, and she declined to give it. For some people, this is a clear indicator that she's lying and that she has nothing and that she's simply trying to get a settlement or extort Porzingis and his legal team. I don't know necessarily about that one because I can totally see how if you don't have a whole lot else, like her whole case, not necessarily the whole case, but her whole claim to getting the settlement and the money she wants hinges on this document. So if she just gave it over, how do we know the document doesn't get lost or destroyed? I get it. You're holding on to your one chip in this case, assuming it's real. Otherwise, it's just her not being able to provide legitimate evidence. And for the record, even if the document is fake, doesn't do away with everything in the accusations. Hear me now when I say this. If KP sexually assaulted, raped, or beat this woman, fuck KP. I'm not even kidding. I have no tolerance. I can't cheer a dude if he does these things. I can't then cheer him on the basketball court or if it's a football player on the football field or what have you. It doesn't matter. I can't look at you the same. Your moral character is severely in question. If this isn't true, however, then it's a really unfortunate thing. Uh, among the... Among the whole process of all this, the woman at some point went to the Knicks. So it's been eight months in total since the incident happened. At some point, the woman went to the Knicks around late October and early November. But prior to that, she continued to try and reach out to KP, as I mentioned, sending texts, trying to uh, basically have alone time again, sending photos. We don't know if there were other sexual encounters beyond that initial night, but the fact that she continued to pursue him is already going to weaken her case uh, should it come to actual legal action. And in the midst of all that, it only turned really negative once he stopped answering her text messages. He would act pleasant if he ran into her in the building, but he would not answer her text messages. I guess, obviously, she never got this money, even though it's been 
over a year now since she tried to get it. And she went to the Knicks in late October, early November to try and basically get them to mediate the process and to make KP honor this contract she had signed. The Knicks legal team, fully aware, they talked about it. They took notes and documented her complaint. And ultimately, they decided they weren't going to get in the middle of this. They pretty much said, I think, mid-November, this is between KP and you. Uh, you know, if federal law enforcement asks us to get involved in some way, we'll comply. We'll, you know, participate in that regard. But we're not getting in the middle of this right now. Now, keep in mind, being still in 2018, this is before the Knicks have decided they're done with KP, right? They didn't trade KP until the end of January 2019. So as far as they're aware, they have their own employee, their own asset to worry about in this case and to want to protect. So the fact that they kind of are dismissive of it in the sense that they're like, I don't know if something happened. If it did, it's you know your recourse, how you want to solve that, but we're not getting in the middle of it. She basically was seeking a private... Uh, process a private disclosure or mediation from the Knicks so that she wouldn't go public with it. And even then, he gets traded and she waits until February. So she goes several months of basically radio silence before going public with it. And among the things she wants, this is just a detail popping back into my mind from the article, among the things she wants is her favorite pair of gray and orange Jordan slides, as she calls them, basically her flip-flops, that she says she left at KP's apartment and never got back. Okay, weird weird thing to throw in there, but, you know, you do you. I, I have serious questions on this. I really do. It doesn't make sense to me why... If he did these horrible things to you, even if you then decided, oh, he seems much nicer the following morning once he's sobered up, he seems much nicer, therefore I can go ahead and be involved with... No, man, if he smacks you around, if he does half of the things alleged, there's no way. That seems like that's something that's reported immediately. Even if you're, you know, even if you're a little bit of a freak in bed and you like more physical sex, I feel like there are things in there that crosses a certain line. And the fact that you then continue to pursue him only to come back after the fact and then determine, you know what? I knew the whole time that wasn't acceptable, but now because we're not going to have a romantic relationship and now because you're freezing me out and still haven't paid the money, now I'm going to make it a public thing. And now I'm going to say, you're going to have to pay consequences for this whole thing. That's suspicious to me. KP and his team, his legal team, uh, they alleged that this was an extortionate attempt by the woman. And before the Mavericks trade even went down, I think this is still in November of 2018, they actually contact the FBI. And now they're conducting some kind of investigation. The NYPD has refused to comment on whether they're actually investigating Porzingis for rape, even though the initial report said that he was being investigated for rape. Man, I, I don't know. It, it's getting crazy in this regard. The Knicks have declined to comment. We know that the Knicks told the Mavericks that there was an extortion attempt active against KP, but they never said the full truth of it. They never said that KP was being accused of rape. This is so substantial to me. I feel like there has to be some kind of consequences for this for the Knicks. I really do because that's like you knowing a guy is going to be indicted and arrested for murder or something and then trading him before the news breaks and being like, ha-ha, he's your problem now. We got assets back for him. No, man, that's not how it works. You you dealt not in good faith, there should be some kind of consequence. That's just my thinking. I don't even know what that consequence is. I would say a large fine, maybe take away a draft pick. I don't know that I take away their lottery pick. Uh, to me, that somewhat hinges more so on the validity of the claims. If it turns out that it did happen, in which case, A, fuck KP, and B, if it did happen, then at that point, and the Knicks had reason to believe they knew it happened, then at that point, 
I would be okay with taking away their lottery pick, but that's neither here nor there. That's talking pure basketball in a story. That's not pure basketball. So what we know is that KP, um, his team has referred it to the FBI. The NBA was made aware of it long before. The NBA Players Association has said, given all the information that we've seen and been told and that we've been able to determine and infer, we stand with KP. That's all we know right now. That's where things stand. The woman says that the incident happened the night he tore his ACL, that she went to his apartment for an autograph, that he texted her hours later to come back saying he was drunk, that they had a very apparently physical sexual encounter. She alleges that he punched her in the face repeatedly, damaging the cartilage of her nose and requiring $10,000 reconstructive surgery days after the fact, uh, that he spit in her face, that he basically used racial slurs that after he sobered up, he was very remorseful about it, that he offered a basically settlement to kind of make amends for his behavior. And that after the fact, she continued to pursue him. We know that from the text messages, she continued to text him specifically uh, requesting more intimate moments with him, uh, sending him salacious photos I don't know when the contract was handwritten and signed. It might have been that next morning around, you know, before 11 o'clock, which is when she says she left his apartment finally. If that's the case, then at what point in the night was this filed? Uh, or not filed. When was it written? Was KP sober? Because you can't be held to a document or contract. You sign when you're not sober, you're not in your proper state of mind. But again, the story is not even that. I don't care about KP's $68,000. Frankly, I really don't. What I care about is if he actually did this and if it was non-consensual. I get people have weird fetishes and things that they like. Maybe that was something that they rolled with. And I would say, that's a little out there for me and I'm not comfortable with that. But if it's consensual I guess I don't know but if he did it if it was without her consent and if it involved physical battery and just some really disgusting things to say and ways to treat a person never mind the fact that he was only doing this at best on one leg because yeah you play an NBA game I know KP after he tore his ACL was wanting minutes later to go back into the game but bro you're still on an adrenaline high I mean I realize this is not apples to apples in the sense that I'm about to tell a story from when I was in high school, but there there was a time in high school I ruptured a tendon in my right foot, and I I did it in the first quarter of the game, and I played through the remainder of the game, and I felt okay. I just kept it loose. I kept it warmed up. The muscles, everything held too, and it was the next morning when I woke up that suddenly it was like, holy crap, it felt like a knife was embedded in the side of my foot. I couldn't put any weight on the foot at all, and I spent the next six weeks in a walking boot. Hours later, let alone like six, seven hours later perhaps, like when this incident might have taken place, KP's not on an adrenaline high from his knee anymore. He's now in pain. He now has limited mobility. That doesn't mean he couldn't have done it. We don't know. It's not like we know positions or anything like that that were used uh, but it is said, I believe, that she she contends that he held her down and had his way with her without her consent. So he's seven three. He's a big dude. I don't know her size or height or anything like that, but there there are some questions there. Uh, hell, if it's happening and it's without your consent and you're not on board with it, kick the knee. Kick at the knee. I don't know. I don't want to victim blame if this is the case, if she is a real victim, if this actually happened the way she alleges that it happened, then yeah, uh, I don't want to throw her under the bus. Anytime a woman comes forward with an accusation this serious, it is serious. You need to hear it out. And then you need to go a step beyond. Some people stop at that first step where you hear it out and you just accept it as truth. I don't think that that's fair or logical. I think that you have to look at the evidence as it's presented. And right now, the evidence that's come through ESPN via emails with her and the Knicks legal team, with text messages with her and Kristaps Porzingis, it doesn't sound 
it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of weight to this. It sounds like she wrote up a document trying to somewhat extort him after he didn't uh, continue forward with a romantic relationship like she wanted. And I don't know. I don't even know if the $68,000 is for her brother's college tuition. That might just be an attempt to kind of spin it, to kind of spin it to sound like, see, I'm not the bad guy. I don't even want it for me. I'm doing it to help my brother, uh, you know, make his life better and, you know, continue to grow. I, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't like talking about this, but this is the gist of what we've been given. As more information comes out, I'll talk about it. How do I think this affects the Mavericks? Well, the Mavericks didn't know when the trade went down. They were not told about this. So I think that absolves the Mavericks of whatever blame people might have been directing their way, saying it was a bad look and it's gross for their front office to do this, to allow this, given you know we had the reports previously of the front office and Pants DJ and the sales team. It wasn't the front office. Excuse me. It was the sales team, uh, Pants DJ and all of that, and the sexual harassment and things. All of that is completely unacceptable. And so this, for a lot of people, was even worse. And I think this absolves the Mavericks in that capacity. But regardless, it's going to be a bad look because depending on how long this draws out, now you're going to have questions about like, okay, so not only do free agents who might come here have to look at this and say, hey, uh, I'm assuming KP hasn't played in over a year. I'm assuming he's going to be back to form because he's 23 years old and he's such a rare talent. I'm assuming he'll get back to form and then it'll be him and Luca and me uh, playing together. Now, depending on how long this draws out, you have to say, oof, that doesn't look good. One, is KP going to be there and available, or is this going to somehow derail him in some very serious ways? Or two, or and two, and or, am I now going to have to sign, you know, if I sign with the Mavericks, am I now going to have to answer questions about the whole thing? And I don't want to talk about something like this. You know, like these are real legitimate questions for free agents. So there are questions surrounding the Mavericks uh, as a result of this, even though it sounds like the front office now isn't to blame for taking on a, frankly, a guy that most teams probably wouldn't touch. And that's why I circled back to the Knicks saying, you know, if they knew something and withheld that information, they should be held responsible because if, if they were aware of it and they withheld that information because they knew, hey, if this story breaks, I don't think anyone's going to want to touch him for a little while. Now, that doesn't mean that maybe the story wouldn't have blown over by the summer and then they could move him, but depending on the depth of what they know and the truth to the accusation, this could be really shady for the Knicks. And I ugh, I don't know, man. I'll keep you guys updated as more comes out, but this is basically my thoughts after reading the Woj article talking about the developments in the case, as more is made clear, I will continue to follow up. That's all for this, though. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.